Well, welcome, Honors Biology students. Taking a look at the weekly schedule again, March 30th, Monday. I'm going to go over some of the most missed things, just review some uh, basic Punnett squares, monohybrid and dihybrid, go over some karyotype things, and a little bit on pedigrees. Um, I don't know if study guide's the greatest thing to write there for your homework. It'll probably be a self-test. It's not going to be a lot of points. It's going to be probably 20. Um, I do have a study guide for regular that I could put on there if you guys want a little extra to do. Um, Wednesday is going to be our help session. It will take place at 10 a.m. I'm basically going to give one code out for everyone. I don't know if I anticipate everybody being on there. If you need help, that's where you need to be at 10 a.m. on Wednesday. I will put a link on Google Classroom um, at 10 a.m., around 10 a.m., maybe 9.30. Um, you choose whether you want to be there or not. If you show up and you have some questions, otherwise it's going to give you a direct immediate feedback on that chapter 10 quiz and I or excuse me not quiz but study guide self test um, I'm gonna take a good look at those test scores um, if I see what I like we're gonna be fine if, if, if I don't meaning that I get guys that are getting ones two single digits it's probably means that we're not putting much work into them and it's probably a waste of my time putting them on the uh, <clears throat> or typing them out I guess for your guys's uh, benefit um, Thursday, I'll get you a code out for that test. Again, we need three hours this week. Somehow we're going to find three hours. Uh, this video is probably going to take 15 to 20 minutes. And your test is probably going to take around an hour. So now we've got uh, an hour and 20 minutes, maybe an hour and a half. So that study guide's got to take you maybe an hour and a half. I'm not sure it's going to be that long, but I do anticipate you studying a little bit on your own there for the test that's going to take place on Thursday. Um, with that being said, I'm going to move along here. I'm going to go to a full screen to see if that helps you guys out. I might have to slide over to my uh, video camera here real quick and you guys kind of take a look at uh, that example. I'm going to look at my camera and make sure everything's on there. Yeah, camera's looking pretty good. I could maybe bring it up just a hair. So if you look at here, it says, what are these examples of, and then give one example of each in there or from the book. If we look at this one here, we can see that we have a red flower and generation, the parent generation, and a white flower. Uh, we're crossing those two, and we're getting somewhere in between. We're getting a blend here. Now remember back to Mendel. Mendel, let's see what he, how did he get lucky. Mendel got lucky because he studied pea, garden pea plants. They have seven distinct characteristics. Um, and they show complete dominance. Remember, I uh, gave you a little example of one table, all of them were tall, the other ones, all of them were short. And remember, he's the guy that, uh, instead of letting the peas self-pollinate or self-fertilize, he would cross-fertilize them. He would take the stamen, cut it off, transfer the pollen over to the female portion of the plant. And then again, we ended up with that F1 generation. He thought somewhere in between. He had the tall, we had the short. He thought getting somewhere in between. Didn't happen. They were all tall. And he came up with two words, dominant and recessive. He knew that something was masking that um, recessive trait that he once saw. Um, if you look up here, we end up with a red, a white, and we have red, white petals. And then we see that they have a pink. This is a blend. This would be that incomplete dominance. So this is an example of incomplete dominance. If we think about what was in the book, in the book we had uh, uh, straight hair, curly hair. I believe the hair types were the example of incomplete dominance in the book. I go over here, remember my example of a black, my black rooster, my white hen, and I get that speckled. I see both the black and the white are both, therefore both are being expressed. That's co-dominance. Again, if this were my black rooster, my white hen, and they and it was gray, that would be incomplete. This is not incomplete. This is both are being expressed. That's co-dominance. If you think of the A, B blood type, that would be an example of co-dominance from the book. So just remember, um, that will be on the assessment. Um, a quick little thing on the end, so we're going down to the end of the chapter. In, on karyotypes, we covered that pretty good. Turner, Kleinfelter, Jacob syndrome, uh, trisomy 21 Down syndrome. Now this is autosomal 
and and this was toward the end of the chapter also. Huntington's disease was mentioned, deterioration of the central nervous system, dominant genetic disorder. It is an autosomal dominant disorder. So remember, autosomal means all non-sex chromosomes. Think about how many you have. How many pairs do you have? You have 22 pairs. You have one pair of sex chromosomes. You're either XX, female, XY, male. So these are would be in the autosomal. So it's an autosomal dominant disorder. And if you look here, this person is little, little. They would not have it. That would be the norm. That's all of us, the large percent of the population. Okay, big age, little age, carrier. No, they're not a carrier. It's a dominant genetic disorder. It, that means they have it. So when we put this into the Punnett square, and again, a Punnett square is a tool used to calculate probabilities. Now, let's think about a couple things. What can we learn from here? Well, on the quiz, it talked about gametes. Gametes, what gametes could be formed for the parents? Well, this one can only be this one or this one. That's the two gametes that can be formed. Here we have the big H or the little H. So there's two gametes that can be formed there. Only one here. We drop them in, write the big one first. Drop them in, big one first. So if we look up here, this person has it. Has it. Here, no. Here, no. So it's a 50-50 shot in this situation. Okay, 50% of the offspring will have Huntington's. Now I go to another one that's mentioned. This now is an autosomal recessive. And if you get these, if you don't know these, you're going to get them confused. So make sure you look in your notes, see what you have, because all of a sudden it starts talking autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, then sex linked. If you don't know, you're going to be confused, and then you're going to have trouble come test time. So if we're looking again, monohybrid, only one trait we're looking at, cystic fibrosis. It looks like both of these now, now to be have cystic fibrosis, it's a recessive. You need the little allele. These two, yes, would be termed carriers here. They have it, it's not being expressed. So we got a capital C, lowercase. Those are the two gametes formed from that one, two gametes formed from this one. We put them into the Punnett square, we drop it down. How many? Show me with your fingers. Yeah, one, exactly. That individual has cystic fibrosis. So that's a one out of four, that's a 25% probability of the offspring having cystic fibrosis. Again, recessive. The other one we looked at, Huntington's, dominant. Now let's take a look at that sex linked. This started, I said, this is a tough way to start out regular biology, right? Honors kids can get it, regular biology stress, struggle a little bit with this. It was gifts from your parents. It would have been the activity that we started with uh, the czar. That would be Tsar uh, Nicholas II and his wife, Alexandra. They had a son, Alexis. If we look, that would be her. She is a carrier. He did not have it. Who's more prone to get sex linked? Well, if it's on the X chromosome, males. They only have one X chromosome. Now we drop things in here, and let's see what it ends up with. It says what probability of the offspring. If it's a male, we have, again, when male and female mate, is 50-50% boy or girl. Of the males, 50% of the males, this one's going to have it. This would be the genotype for young Alexis not have it. Over here, carrier doesn't have it. So neither of these two have hemophilia. Okay. Hemophilia is a recessive sex-linked disorder. Going on, um, let's think about the quiz now. What are, what are we struggle on? Some of this right here. It didn't give you this. It expected you, It when it said we're doing a dihybrid cross, both parents are heterozygous for both traits. So I see purebred, purebred, or true breeding, true breeding. And then these are both heterozygous. So they're crossing these. Remember, we talked about the gametes, also one that was most missed. Gametes, I take this big Y, goes with the big R. Little Y goes with the big R. Big Y goes with the little R, little Y, little R. And again, same gametes each side here. So these are the four combinations that can be produced by that parent. We have to remember that 9331 ratio. Anytime we have a dihybrid cross where both parents are heterozygous for both traits, it ends up being a 9331 ratio. What does that mean? That means that we have 
dominant, dominant. Nine out of the 16 are going to be dominant, dominant. Is that dominant, dominant? Yes. Dominant, dominant? Yes. Dominant, dominant? Yes. Dominant, dominant? Yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine out of 16. And then the question on the quiz was, you given a thousand offspring, how many are going to be dominant, dominant for both? Well, you would have to take a thousand times nine divided by 16. That's going to give you the number you're looking for. Out of a thousand, how many? Nine sixteenths. Then how about how many are going to be dominant recessive? Okay, so if I see dominant, oops, dominant recessive, there's one. Dominant recessive, there's one. Dominant recessive. Three out of six. So given a thousand offspring, how many are going to be dominant recessive? Well, three sixteenths of them are. And then dominant or recessive dominant, one, two, three. And how many are going to be recessive? Recessive, one out of the 16. So that was one of the ones on the quiz, chapter 10 quiz, most missed, right there. Gametes, and then this. Calculating if a thousand offspring, how many are going to be dominant recessive. So pay attention to that, put that example in, you're going to see one again. Next thing, we went on. Mondays. Now, some of you were good. You went through, even knowing that you didn't have to do it. You went on, got it done. Keegan did a little talking and bought an eight-minute video, Keegan and I, and we pre-showed you his karyotype. So when I asked the first question, is this karyotype of a human? I said earlier, even in this presentation, you have 22 pairs of autosomal and one pair of sex chromosomes. 22 pairs, that's 44 total, and then 45, 46. All of you have 46, Keegan has 47, okay? So is this human? Well, 16, 17, no, that can't be human. We said 22, 23. So again, not a human karyotype here. And remember, karyotype's a picture of all the organisms, chromosomes, or individuals' chromosomes. It says, what is the gender of this organism? Pretty easy one. I see the X and a Y. Those are sex chromosomes, X, Y, male. It says, how are karyotypes arranged? So if I look up here, I know we get from mom, from dad, you get 23 from mom, 23 from dad. How do they go together, Splinter? Well, biggest one from mom, biggest one from dad. Second biggest one from mom, second biggest one from dad. It's all the way down from big to little. That's how a karyotype is arranged. And how many total autosomal chromosomes are there? Now, not pairs, it says total. So we have to count here. So I start with one. So I see there's something wrong here already. But anyway, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33. 33 total autosomal chromosomes. And that says, are there any chromosomal abnormalities? Well, I started counting here. I already told you I get one from mom and one from dad. Well, this would be monosomy one. That is a chromosomal abnormality. I got to here, I noticed I counted three. One, two, three. That's trisomy 13. That's three copies. That means you got non-disjunction. Maybe you got two from dad and one from mom. Or you got two from mom, one from dad. You ended up with three, you should have one from each. And then I noticed here, 16. Again, trisomy. We've got three copies. Should only have two. So we have trisomy 16, trisomy 13, and monosomy 1. Next up, pedigrees. A couple things missed on pedigrees right here. Generation, generation, generation. Okay. This pedigree deals with cystic fibrosis. I told you early cystic fibrosis is a recessive, autosomal recessive disorder. So if I said, what is the genotype of the following individuals? Generation two, individual five. Generation one, two, three, four. So I need generation two, one, two, individual five. Doesn't have it and is not a carrier. Doesn't have it, not a carrier. That means big C, big C. Generation one, two, three, individual six, one, two, three. carrier. Therefore, that's a big C and a little c. Generation four, one, two, three, four. Individual three has it, little c, little c. Now, some of you are smart enough to go, hey, Spooner, that can't happen here. Just remember, 
I run the pedigree. I can change a square and a circle and all that good stuff. So one more time, remember, unaffected, affected. Unaffected female, affected female, carrier female. Unaffected male, affected male. And this is actually has a carrier male, which is really not really realistic. Um, I shouldn't say that. That can, be hap that can happen with cystic fibrosis. My fault. Um, number two, it says calculate the percent of female carriers in the female population. Okay, female carriers. Again, it has to be half shaded circle. One, two, three. Three out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Three out of fifteen. So you guys could run the numbers there for me. I'm not going to bust that out right now. Um, list the number of siblings. Siblings have to be bracketed in generation two. Bra no, that's a horizontal line. Here's a bracketed line. One, two, three, four, five. Another bracketed. In generation three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And in generation four, four, and another four is eight. How many marriages are shown in a pedigree? Horizontal line, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven marriages in this pedigree. Calculate the percent of affected males in the overall population. Affected males will be colored in square. One, two, three, four, five. Five out of 11 plus 11, 22, 30. Five out of 30. So again, if you don't have an example of a pedigree, make sure you have one and make sure you can read, obtain information from that table or chart. That's basically it, guys. Remember, going back real quick here, I'm going to run all the way back. I will put the video up. I'll put the self-test up. You're going to get immediate feedback. If you have any questions on it, you show up at 10 a.m. So, again, I'll put it up there, self-test. It's going to get immediate feedback. I hope you all score 20 out of 20. Now, if you're getting a 10 out of 20, I probably need to see you. On Wednesday we can talk about it go through a couple things I got a real good study thing that's gonna gonna happen on you know I, I think it's good it's gonna have a little on blood typing a karyotype pedigree just some questions that you'll probably see on the test and then some most missed again um, other than that have a good week and everybody's gonna check in again on Friday not gonna be too long just gonna go over what's gonna take place the next week so, talk to you then.